would you please state your name and your rank and a very brief summary of the things you've done in the Air Force? I'm Walter Douglas, Major, retired as Major. I spent about nine years enlisted and about 12 years as an officer. And it was intermittent me that I got into the cadet program as an enlisted man, got my commission and flew combat in B-17s. And after the war, I went back to civilian life and then re-enlisted in my enlisted rank. And for eight years I was enlisted and got up to the rank of Master Sergeant. And that was about 1952 or 53. And I was recalled and had to go through the advanced stages of the aviation cadet program again. <laughs> and uh, after I completed that, <coughs> I was assigned to Carswell to fly the B-36. And I was assigned to a crew as a third pilot. And uh, through the years from uh, 1953 to 1957, I worked my way up to aircraft commander and I went into the B-52 program. And uh, just after I, my crew was checked out, why the Air Force decided that I had a history of migraine headaches and uh, I was grounded. So then I went back into communications as an officer and spent the remainder of my time as a communications officer in uh, up in Canada, the, the province. Can't think of it. R, BC? No, Alberta. the other side. Alberta? New Newfoundland. Oh, Newfoundland. Okay. I, I spent uh, two years, I think, two or three years in Newfoundland and came back here and retired. Okay, thank you. Um, do you want to tell us a bit about your experiences on B 36? The highlights. The highlights. I just wrote some down here. Great. <laughs> uh, I flew in the bombing competition, or the bombing competition in 1954, on the crew that won the bombing competition, and I got the pleasure of meeting General LeMay. Mm. And how was that? Oh, it's pretty neat because. The group I flew in, in B-17s, in World War II, he trained. The 305th Bomb Group can do, mm -hmm. and that's why I flew my missions, 35 missions with them. And uh, so it was quite an honor to receive all, I was the third pilot, so I had to receive all the awards from him. <laughs> that's hard to take. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, going on, uh, also flew the in a B-36 as a co-pilot. The firepower demonstration is either 1956 or 57 down in Florida, mm -hmm. and we dropped 132 500-pound bombs out of the B-36. And then we made a turn, and the uh, B-52 got on one wing, the B-47 on the other wing, and we had a B-66 in unders and we come back over the reviewing stand and we pulled a straight up vertical with the B-36 and just made sort of a bomb burst with the B-52 and the B-47. In the 66, we told the pilot, don't get under, stay off to the side. And he got in our wash. And at the debriefing, he said he could see the blades of grass. <laughs> our prop wash had pushed him down. <laughs> <laughs> and just kept pushing him down. He said, felt like a big jackhammer just pushing him down. <laughs> Isn't that something? Yeah. I thought you'd be interested yeah, in that. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, talking about that aircraft that you're interested in, yeah. well, I, we had a few fires when I flew. And one fire that we had, I was checking out as aircraft commander here at Carswell. And I was having a tough time. 
I was nervous and all that, and I wasn't making too good in landing. So we got up over Eagle Mountain Lake and we made our turn on the base leg. And just as we turned final, the uh, number two engine caught fire. And he had number six pulled back. Had me a single en uh, yeah. engine, one engine out. Well, he gave me back number six, and that thing's on fire as we're coming down final approach. And it so happened it was a main fuel line broke, and there was black smoke coming out of that thing. And he told me, he says, if you make this a good landing, you're checked out. And I happened to grease that one in. <laughs> <laughs> And another fire we had, uh, we've flown a mission uh, around 20 some hours and we were on our way back here to Carswell. It was in the wee hours of the morning over Arkansas or Tennessee and everybody was sort of relaxed, you know, and we were in the, just underneath a layer of clouds and all at once there was a reflection in the clouds, a real bright light and the scanner's fire. And I don't know which engine it was in, but uh, we started pulling fire bottles on it, trying to get it out. And actually, the, it had burned so fierce that it started to burn the metal. The magnesium was starting. And it took every bottle we had to get it out. And we got on the ground, and the next day we looked, and there was a hole burnt in the accessory section. You could, you could stand in it and it just burned the whole accessory section right out of it. And what caused it was the exhaust, where it went through that accessory section, mm -hmm. sheared. So the hot exhaust was firing into the oh. accessory and it caught that whole thing on fire. So we were lucky to get that one out. It would have been something that it probably, mm -hmm. I've heard that some of those engines caught on fire and actually burned and fell out of the cell. Probably an outboard, but I don't know about the inboard. And, uh, see, and it had a little uh, excitement with weather. <laughs> Tell us more. <laughs> And the flying co-pilot this time, we were up in the Amarillo area and this front was between us and Carswell. And it was night and we were trying to uh, get back here to Carswell and we just kept going along that front line and the radar man was watching to see if he could find a hole for us to fly through. Well, we got down about Abilene and uh, he seen a gap. And he, so we took a bearing towards that and we're probably up, uh, oh, just before you needed oxygen, probably, you know, 10,000 or something. And uh, we went into that hole, so-called hole, and it closed. And the rain was so heavy that it, evidently, the moisture in the wing got so heavy that it knocked all electricity off. All, all, the engines were still running, but all the lights and everything electrically went out. So the engines stayed set where they were. And uh, when they trained us in the uh, simulator, they always had the co-pilot make sure you had a good flashlight. And I found out what that was for. They just happened to have it right there, held it on the artificial horizon for the AC to hold it straight. And the engineers are working, trying to get the back on the line. And it seemed like 15, 20 minutes before they ever got it back, but actually you got it on a lot sooner than that, I'm sure. And so that's one thing that can happen yeah. with heavy rain like that on an aircraft. And the other one was after I got to be aircraft commander and we flew down at Puerto Rico and we were on our way back. And I, coming into Dallas and I was on instrument flight rules and uh, there was a big front coming towards us and you could see that roll cloud just the edge of Dallas. And I could look over and see Carswell on the right. So I called uh, and tried to get a clearance to go visual and land at Carswell. Well, I had another aircraft in the air 
that had an emergency, and I found out later that they'd got in so much turbulence that it cracked the fuselage. And they could actually see the fuselage, see the crack opening and closing. And that's what they were worried about. They weren't worried about me. And I went into that roll cloud, and we went up first, <laughs> and then down. <laughs> and when we went down, the co-pilot's headset went right to the top of the canopy. And we came out, and we got up here at the, the Homer Newark, right at North End of Eagle Mountain Lake. And uh, there was thunderstorms all around us, and we started to make a turn trying to get into the traffic pattern here at Carswell. And we were probably about 8,000 or around that, and started to make that turn. And one of those mini bursts caused, we didn't know what they were then, you know, that started oh, talking. Yeah. And I got into the turn, and both of the co-pilot and I on it, and we could not get it out of that turn. It just kept going, and it kept descending, and kept taking us down, down, and there was nothing we could do. And all at once, it just let go just like that. And we were down about 1,500 feet and in the traffic pattern. And I tried to call and, and clear my instrument clear so that I was in the traffic pattern. And they were so busy with that other aircraft that didn't even know it, and I never heard a word about it. We came in and landed. Next day we went down, it was the seventh bomb wing aircraft. We went down and they had props under the tail, holding that tail up. <laughs> Let's see, what else did I have? Oh yeah, when I, <laughs> we used to spend uh, TDY in, uh, Morocco, Casablanca, mm -hmm. and we went over there maybe 60 days TDY, something like that. And this one time they used us to uh, impress the Saudi Shaw. So we flew a mission from Casablanca to uh, Riyadh, and we flew over Israel and Damascus and all that, over the desert, and there's three of us in formation, and we were supposed to fly a tight formation over that a desert, and it was bumpy. So we started the jets, and the centrifugal mm -hmm. of the jets held that wing stable so it wouldn't flop around, yeah. kept the wing down. And they were just sitting out there idling, and the pilot was flying, and he made a turn with the rest of the group and when he went to roll out, he couldn't roll out. The ailerons were locked. And uh, so I hit with the jets running, I, I don't know whether he told me or whether I thought about it. We reached up and I got the jets and I just brought a, brought a jet in and it just rolled us right out. Just steered it with the jets. And, and his wheels like this and we're steering it with the jets. And we landed like that. I was. I was steering it, and he was doing the up and down, and I was doing the steering. We landed at Riyadh, and we had the uh, crew chief with us, and he jumped out of the plane when we got in Riyadh, kept the engines running, and he went back to the back and traced the cables out, and he found where one, due to the heat of that desert and the bouncing, it jumped the cable out of a pulley, and it was pinched, and he jumped it back in the pulley. We took yeah. back off and went back to Casablanca. <laughs> that's how that, that's how many things, that 36 had so many different things. If we hadn't had those jets on there, yeah. you, you could have used an engine, but it would have been a lot tougher to use an outboard engine. Yeah. But with those jets out there, it would just made it so easy. Some airplane. <laughs> No, I flew the H and J's, the the latter part, the all the featherweights. I flew. Yeah. I had a couple of questions regarding uh, autopilot. Yes. Uh, we were talking a bit about it here yesterday, and uh, we're still not really clear on all the things you have to set and and uh, how it's used, but. Um, I understand that they follow barometric pressure. 
for elevation so that if you don't have an elevation hold on it that the aircraft can move up and down a bit if you enter a different kind of weather where the pressure is higher or lower. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how you use an autopilot? Or? Yes, you had the autopilot that you set for an altitude or you know when you'd get it the altitude you wanted to be and then you set it for straight and level just like any other the, the old autopilots in the b-17 but this had an additional feature it had a, a altitude uh, holder they call it control and i think it worked with the pressure and you could set it you turn it on it would hold you within 100 feet of the where you're at in other words if you set the just the uh, autopilot itself, it would vary too much for the 36 because that thing, the nose was oscillating and the tail was moving. It was, the aircraft itself was moving as you were flying and it was for the, for the autopilot to keep up with it. And in fact, sometimes it gets so bad that the autopilot would start to oscillate you up and down and, you, and you'd have, to, or you'd get in some rough weather and the autopilot's trying to correct for, and it's just behind it. And it get to shaking that aircraft, you had to either, everybody hit the rudder, both of you hit the rudder at the same time and hold it, or knock the autopilot off, because it would get oscillating so bad it, it could actually cause damage. But it did have an altitude controller to hold you within 100 feet. And you could watch that thing go 100 feet up, down, that old nose like this. Most all the time that thing was moving, right? yeah. 